sixth episode of the World Percussion Group series, um, the VTOR 2021. Um, before I forget, please don't uh, forget that we've got a, our first concert later on this evening, which is 8.30 UTC time. Uh, really looking forward to showcasing some amazing talents of the WPG. We have 12 artists from some 10 countries this time around, so it's a pretty, um, pretty amazing project so far. And there's no one better to kick off today than our very own WPG coach, Svet Stoinov. Svet, thank you so much for joining us. It's my treat to be here. Hi, everyone. Great, thank you. So I'm pretty sure Svet needs no introduction whatsoever, but um, I've looked up to Svet for, for a long time. Um, an amazing player and a very versatile player as well. Solo, ensemble, contemporary, you name it, he's, uh, he's on there. So um, thanks, Svet, for joining us. We're going to start with uh, an Elliot Carter piece which is um, from the Eight Pieces for Timpani by Elliot Carter. And we're going to start with the movement called Canaries, which is going to be played by Ashley Ridenauer. And we'll just play a video first. Awesome. Congratulations. This is a great performance. Um, so guys, I, I'll try to be as helpful as I can. Uh, and obviously, Ashley, if you feel like there's specific things you want to talk about, let me know. Um, I actually had the privilege to work and meet the man himself. 
Uh, that is Elliot Carter. And uh, somewhere, I was actually trying to find it, but I couldn't. I have a picture with him, which was pretty funny because I don't think he really takes pictures with people. <laughs> and so it was a very, very interesting that I, I would tell people to go, no way. Uh, but uh, I had a chance to talk to him a little bit about the pieces. And uh, one of the interesting things he told me was that actually the original pieces were written just for regular timpani playing, uh, meaning all the centers, all the different sound effects, etc. They were not part of the pieces. And of course, eventually, John Williams basically that that changed. He he gave the ideas to to add all these amazing colors, add all these beautiful nuances, and almost kind of give a new voice to an instrument which which we know from the orchestra, really. Um, so that's something to keep in mind because I feel like when Elliot Carter was creating the pieces in his ear, he was hearing everything really tonal. And so even though the sounds changed later, I think knowing that he imagined these pieces tonally, I guess would affect how much I, you know, deviate from, from that, that, that warmth or that, that sort of voice of the timpani itself. You know, in other words, how much they want to treat the timpani, say, more like a tom, which is way less pitched, rather than keep playing it like a timpani, even if I'm playing the centers, even if I'm playing on extreme edges, you know, that kind of thing. So in that sense, I would say one suggestion is maybe consider playing the instrument always as a tonal instrument, even though sometimes those, uh, you know, colors and shades and effects are differently so. Because I think otherwise it's easy to sort of remove that from the equation and to kind of make the piece more rhythmic than melodic. And I think Carter always heard it melodically. Um, so something to think about. It's, it's at least one concept. Um, I'm curious about uh, how did you go about deciding on the tempo? And I'll tell you why. I'm not a person, by the way, who looks at a tempo or, or a marking and they go like, you're not doing this and how dare you? It's not about that, but I'm curious, and I'll tell you what I'm thinking too. But why did you decide to go on the quick end of things? Um, for me personally, I, I I wanted to be different in some ways, <laughs> but it's also what came naturally to me. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, I know it's it's based on a dance. And yes. So I I wanted it to be like a little bit more of like an exciting dance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. No. Yes, yes, I understand. So let me ask you this. When you change the tempo of a piece, and in, in this case, you're pulling this slightly forward, right? You're pushing this on the, on the front end. What would you think are the variables that, that you'd need to be aware of compensating a little bit because of that shift? You know, I always find that playing, anything I do, it's always a compromise. No matter what you do, you have to make decisions, and it's basically all serving the music, but you know, if you, if you if you favor one direction, you have to compromise in another. And say, for example, when you go faster, what are the things that you feel you gotta watch out or kind of be aware of that that might need you to, I don't know, sort of give and take, if you will, here. Um, kind of what you mentioned, the making the drum sound more tonal rather than rhythmic. I think mm -hmm. that's. I see. That aspect, as well as maybe some of the playing zone clarity or something. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. My suggestion for me, if, for you, would be to try maybe to lighten everything up when you speed things up. So, for example, uh, I always think that when you're playing quicker, you are having to do the same things with less amount of time. And the more we move to play, the more time we need to take. So sometimes in, in, in natural cases, slow, uh, sorry, lightening everything up a little bit and kind of getting a little closer to the instrument can really help you achieve that tempo and almost make it feel like if it's, the piece was meant to be in that tempo. So think about, uh, think about efficiency. Think about um, how much can you sort of balance your decision of playing a little faster and still give that nuance of the pieces if it was meant to be that quick. I would say one place to go is start a little lighter, start just a little bit more in a sense of, instead of ta -dum -pim, pa -dum -pam, which is very much present opening, if you want to push this forward, maybe ta -dum -pim, ta -dum -pim, ta -dum. so in other words, lighting that enough to where the nature of the tempo 
works better with the nature of the weight and the volume you're producing, you know? So maybe explore that a bit. I think that could help you set the piece in a little bit more natural state, you know, just, you know, one perspective. Um, uh, I wanted to tell you also something uh, about, uh, you know, the rhythms of the piece. You know, I find generally rhythms to me to have a uh, huge meaning in music like this because especially for people who uh, are not very familiar with timpani, I don't think that they're going to experience this music like, say, someone who's really aware of what the timpani sounds like and what we're listening for. You know, we're total geeks compared to a normal person, you know? Um, and so in that case, why the rhythm is important in a different level is because to a normal person, one thing they will always hear is going to be the rhythm. And that's why I feel people are so connected with percussion parts is because it's so, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of comfortable for them. They, they, they think this is a little bit more of a, of a home base rather than the, if you're talking, say, about a violin where they literally go like, I'm going to break this. If, if, you know, I, I'm not, I need to learn more about this before I can touch it. And I think with drums, with rhythms, I think people are used to tapping and how many people have you heard say, I can play drums at Solvay. Yeah, that's right. But so, for example, the shapes here, ta-da-ti, ta-da-ti, ta-da-ta-pa-pa-pa, pa-da-ti, ta-da-ta-ti, ta-da-pa-pa, right? When you have these dotted, uh, sorry, I'm going to look at the score here for a second, but when you have these uh, dotted uh, uh, 16s and also the dotted 8 notes, to me, those are not just sort of rhythms that are different durations. They have different shapes. Ta ta ti ta ti ta ti ta tang kara ting kara. So if one is a little bit rounder, the other one is a little bit more angular, right? So right now I feel like you're focusing more on the, I guess the big beat. Ta ta ri ta ta ra ti ta ti ta ti. If you do that, eventually you tend to compress a lot of the rhythms, and because you're playing the piece a little faster, that naturally is going to want to happen anyway, right? Because the leaning of the piece, if, if this is the tempo, so if I could do this, and faster is here, what's happening is when you play a little quicker the tempo, then everything you do tends to lean this way. So knowing that, you have to actually kind of open these rhythms to counter them. So I look for not only the rhythm being correct, but also finding that sort of roundness to them. And almost juxtaposing them as different kinds of musical tools, if you will, for the, for the listener. So something to think about, it's not about only accuracy of rhythm, but I guess the shape of the rhythm and how it comes across. Um, you talked about something interesting I wanted to ask you. You said that there is a lot of really aggressive moments in the piece. Talk a little bit about your, your concept of that. Because look, for me, just so you know, I am a hugest fan of the fact that each one of you has made this their own performance. And my goal is only to discuss with you rather than tell you, oh, you should do this or you should do that and don't do what you're doing. So I'm curious because I don't necessarily see it as, as you do, but that's a really wonderful thing so we can have a discussion on it. So what do you think about the aggressive part of this? Um, some of the abrupt like shifts from you know, a soft moment on the rims or a soft mm -hmm. moment in the centers to um, these loud, kind of like harsh sounds in the centers of the drums. Yes. Um, that are fortissimo and accented um, and slow. So it gives you time to really like whack the drums <laughs> <laughs> but it gives you time to wind up and really hit the drums and I think yes. that to me is a is a moment where you can show like aggressiveness or, or power yes yes I, I understand you know one of the things that I have learned throughout time when I have played all the concerts I play and I've been fortunate to be able to keep learning on the job is that everything is very context-based. You know, it, it literally is, what you're telling me makes perfect sense, but the context of basically when are you playing that and where are you playing on the drum affects a lot, for example, of how you do it. So for example, sometimes I think it tends from what I'm hearing to double down a little bit. For example, when you're playing a fortissimo with an accent, which I totally hear, there's a few here and there's these kind of beautiful magical pillars of the piece. If you're playing the center of the drum, you already know you're going to have a completely different density on the head. You're going to have um, kind of a not really a tympano in a normal sense. So if you kind of double down on this, you might outdo what already is happening a little bit naturally. 
So what, what I want to suggest is maybe it's worth exploring when you have these particular goals of saying, I want this to be far dense, I want this to be majestic, but also have that, have that extra brightness, have that oomph, you know? Maybe consider what is the concept of, concept of where you're playing. Is the drum already giving me that? And if so, how much do I want to add out for myself? Because one of the things, especially you know, when you're playing, and I, I, I understand that a lot of times people do tend to play the Carter pieces on balanced action timpani for no, numerous reasons. And, and, and I think that it's actually a nice way to do it too. Uh, those drums don't handle volume and pressure the same way a real symphonic instrument does. So even more so to think about this, just as a thought. Because sometimes I, I remember, you know, I record myself often, listen to what I do. And for me, my big question is, do I sound in real time as to what I'm thinking in my head and what I think I'm hearing? And obviously, that's one of the most important ways to learn is to record yourself and, and go check it out. And sometimes I'll just be stunned listening to something going, I thought this rocked. You know, I thought that this sound I made, it was really full and powerful. And I listen go, yeah, really? Was it? So in these cases, I think your intent is beautiful. The question is, if you record yourself and listen, would you find it to come across like you intended? Yeah. Um, another thing to add to you uh, as, as a thought is this music has tremendous amount of very dramatic uh, dynamic changes. From fortissimo to piano and from forte to pianissimo, there's just a lot of this. And, you know, when you play timpani, you're like trying to tame a beast, you know. I feel like naturally the instrument is ringing, especially the more in tune the heads are, the more everything you're doing is sort of uh, synced and comfortable, which in your case it is, then the, the drums are just ringing. And I find that you've got to be really conscious of muting, especially simultaneous muffling, and making sure that, especially in these moments, the whole purpose of that subito is to be heard. So if you, in, in, my, in my case, for example, you know, talk about context, if I'm playing something and if I know that after this forte there's, or forte, there's no way you'll hear my subito, I'll, I'll think in a couple of ways to supplement. Maybe my subito is slightly louder. Maybe my articulation changes on that subito so you can hear me, you know, peeking through that sort of dying sound from another, from another head. Or maybe I simultaneously muffle for a little bit longer time and I, I place that next entrance to where I know that subito can speak up. Sometimes, I guess, I'm trying to really make sure that what comes across is the message as well as the, the musical text. And even if I play the perfect subito, if the listener cannot hear it, then my question is, what can I do for them to do it, to hear it? So that was another thing that kind of struck me as, as, as something to share. And I know this is really not easy to do. For example, I taught myself early in my studies... Um, not simultaneously muffling or not muting the drums very well because I just didn't play as much timpani as, as I say, played uh, uh, chamber music or, or solo percussion or solo marimba. And so I realized, well, okay, I need to spend some time. And what I realized I was doing is I would barely mute sometimes, but I would register that as a motion. I'd be like, hey, here it is. But then I'd move on and I'd listen to the head and go, that head is ringing. I'm not done. And so I realized that what I was not doing is thinking of the muting as a process of playing. And it's just as important as actually playing anything, right? Basically, we percussionists rarely have to deal with sound sustain and controlling the ends of sounds. And I think because of that, our psychology doesn't make us worry about how we actually mute and etc. So I spend a bunch of time figuring out, and one of the things I learned is actually that you know, if you can stretch these three fingers basically to mute because you're holding the stick with the other two, right? And you find where does the drum like you to mute and sort of there's no buzzing, but at the same time, you can really efficiently do it and move on. I got some really great results. So maybe something to explore, you know, easier said than done, right? And, and what you're doing is excellent. Um, but I know in this piece, especially that's one place I find a lot of times there to be conflict between, you know, what do we want to hear versus what's going on around us? So taming that, that sort of beautiful and yet sometimes pretty, you know, nasty quality of overwhelming ring. And funny because some of this is actually, um, you know, you have a perfect fifth you have to tune here. So that's a whole other problem where if your drums are really in tune, they're going to ring no matter what. So uh, sympathetic resonance also can play a fact. Um, do you have a question that's specific to what you're doing that I can try to maybe just, I don't know, we could chat about for a second or not. I feel like it's tricky 
to, to go too much in depth with the time we have, and at the same time, I don't want to make, you know, only comments from what I think. Uh, I, I have a question about something you said about the muting. Um, mm. So in this piece, like, he, he specifies moments where he wants you to mute. Mm -hmm. um, would you add your own muting to kind of make some of those forte pianos come across? Yes, 100%. Do you know what muting markings sometimes are like, or therefore the lack of? It's sometimes the, the, the sort of the equivalent sometimes of people putting, sticking, saying marimba, very, very complex marimba pieces. And you're going, uh, if I am good enough to play this piece, I probably can figure out my own stickings. Thank you. Do you know what I'm saying? And here, what's happening is I think the way I think about this is they've said, here is where you really have to mute. And the mutings I'm talking about is what I'm saying is in certain contexts, the music demands that I do that or else what the listener will hear will not be what's on the page. So, you know, as, it's funny, I just had a big conversation with my studio yesterday, I had a class with them, and we were talking exactly about this, how it's so important that we are always performers aware of what the listener experiences, especially because they experience it one time, and they have zero of the amount of knowledge we do about the piece and about the art form, etc. So what they get out of it is sort of very much dependent on how can we translate the message to them, and how well can we let them hear what we want them to hear. So your, your, your question is spot on, and I figure this is, again, contextual. And maybe some people might disagree, but I find it that some places you may just have to mute so that you can hear what's next, regardless of, of the markings. And vice versa, maybe sometimes you say, you know what, I don't know if this is necessary. Again, I guess knowing the score really well and interpreting it, yeah, I, I try to serve basically that. And so that's kind of where I get informed from this. But you're, you're spot on with it. It's a really great question. Yes, I know. I know there is a um, four more people that have to uh, that, that we have to listen to. I want to make sure that we, we do this frank, and honest, time wise, and fair. So, Tim, are we good on time? How do we how are we doing on time for a bunch of percussionists? You are bang on, sir. Yes. Congratulations, Ashley. I thought that was really great. Uh, if, you, if any of you want to talk to me about these pieces in a little more time, we can also connect afterwards. We're all colleagues, we're all musicians. Thank you. Good job, Ashley. Well done. Okay, great. So now we're going to move over to... Who are we going to move over to? Yes, we are. We're going to move over to Philip. We're going to go to Sweden for a little bit. And... Philip is going to be playing uh, Frozen, which is a concerto by Avner Dorman, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Frozen, frozen in time he is. That's right. Exactly. Yep. That is correct. So uh, just cue this one up. Philip, do you, whilst I'm queuing this up, do you just want to talk a little bit about the piece? Yeah. So I performed this, I guess it was early March or something. Um, so that's where the, where the recording is from. Um, and I had to make some cuts, so that's why there is no uh, cowbells. Let's see. Okay. This is the cut part. Here we go. This is where Philip <laughs> made the cut. <laughs> Thank you. 
because of time. Okay. Um, stopping for time just to, to give you. Uh, yeah. So great work. Uh, this is Thanks. this is uh, a tricky piece to play. I know it has a lot of yeah. um, technical challenges to begin with. And I think you're doing yeah. a great work with that. So um, I want to tell you a couple of specific things, I guess, about playing concerto that I think would be really helpful. Yeah. Uh, is this how much experience do you have playing concerti? So this was basically my first time playing a concerto in some time. I played it when I was very young, like in high school times, you know, uh, you get to play sometimes with some sure. uh, orchestras. But this was like after very many years, my first time playing, actually. Right. OK, I think yeah. you, you, you did a really wonderful job, especially for this being one of your first experiences. I really mean that sincerely. It's a very different experience than playing a solo recital or chamber music. And whoever has not experienced playing concerto, I guarantee you the way you have to prepare for this and what you have to be able to do on stage and the flexibility you need to have and the, the listening you have to do, they're very different. And you have to be extremely confident and very, very well prepared. Knowing the score, not just your parts, understanding what the conductor needs and how to play with the orchestra. It's mm -hmm. a very particular skill and, and, you know, it's a delight, but one has to be really aware of what to expect and how to prepare for it. So a uh, couple, couple technical, so, so, a couple ta tactical, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. hints. I think your setup, it was very curious to me. Was, was this something that they asked you to do is to kind of spread it out like this? Or was this your decision? Uh, you mean like with, where I where stood the, according to where, the orchestra. Yeah. According. This was the like a Corona situation concert. So we just had to be very far apart. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because the, the musicians were very close together. So mm -hmm. here's why I'm saying this. Uh, generally speaking, and that, that's sort of an unwritten rule, but generally speaking, when you play a mallet instrument, which is basically an instrument where when you're playing, you cannot look up most of the time while you're playing. Yeah. Position yourself in such a way that you can always see the conductor with your peripheral vision, always. Mm -hmm. Because right now, if you notice, uh, when, I was, when I was observing you play this, I know you're doing a really great job in places when you could not look. There were moments where you guys got off just a little bit. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I know that that was not necessarily your doing, but you can respond more if you are able to see what the intention is just with your peri peripheral mm -hmm. vision. And that is basically why anytime you have a vibraphone or marimba, especially with also really busy instruments to play and normally the parts are virtuosic, mm -hmm. no matter what they tell you, you have to say, I need to be able to see. That means I get positioned, maybe how I angle the instrument changes. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to see the conductor even when I'm looking down. That's it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so something for you to think about overall, that brings a whole big other question, which is strategically when you play, regardless of just the sonics, which are important, Strategically, what do you need to do to give yourself a better opportunity to play well? Mm. You know, so that brings me to another strategic point, which is the sonics of your setup. So obviously, mm. the marimba is going to be the instrument, which is probably the quietest, mm. probably the darkest color wise so far between the percussion and the marimba, that is. Um, and so therefore, you've put it closer to the audience, right? Mm. That, that's exactly right. And I, I think when you're making setups, those kind of decisions also come to play a lot. When we're talking with Ashley, for example, sometimes the score could say something very different. And, you know, maybe the conductor had something really visual in mind, etc. But remember, you are also playing this and you need to be heard. So be conscious about how do you need to set up to get the best sounds out with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Yeah, I definitely felt like um, no matter what I did, I couldn't really be heard even in the general rehearsal and, and stuff. This, this is also, an uh, it was a wind orchestra and this was like a, mm -hmm. an arrangement. But uh, yeah, and they are not a big wind band either, but still yes. I had a lot of difficulties, even with very, very hard mallets right. to kind of go through. Yeah, that, That's right. And, and I was just literally about to go into that with you. So... Mm -hmm. What do you do in a situation like this? Uh, because, so first of all, did you, you, you were aware of this during rehearsals, right? Yeah. Okay. So one way to approach this is, did you record yourself in rehearsals? Were you able to kind of... No, I didn't. Uh, but I did have my teacher come into the general rehearsal. And I, I do have to say also that that on the rehearsals, I had an easier time coming through than on the concert. This was the first concert in 
a year for them as well. So they were very happy to be loud. Uh, <laughs> very <I think>. extra <laughs> happy. Yeah. Sure, sure. It's, it, we all feel this. And, you know, there's nothing more beautiful than having a Jewish concert. Yeah. So a um, couple things. Uh, generally speaking, when you're playing with a large group of musicians, uh, you're going to find that the marimba is going to have a really hard time coming through. That's, that's literally it. And that's why when you're listening to uh, any concerto soloist, any person playing the marimba as part of an orchestral setup, concerto with orchestra, with an ensemble, does not matter, you will hear them playing with really hard mallets. You will hear, almost kind of uh, a little bit sort of brutally hard mallets. And you go like, what are you doing? Yes, what, are you, what they're doing, they're trying to basically be heard. And what you have to be really I guess conscious of navigating is how do you also communicate with the conductor. Some conductors clearly understand the issue experience. Some conductors are not yet really, you know, in, in, in they, they have maybe not played yet with a percussion soloist as much, or maybe not with a marimba player, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, that brings a whole different question. And I think communicating with the conductor is really important. I think after right. a first rehearsal, I would definitely find them and make sure that first of all, I ask them for their feedback. Because mm. that's something really, I mean, this is your collaborator with the orchestra, so you have to make sure. And if mm. you have any concerns, I think a lot of times people in their desire to be really res really respectful, they end up actually not saying things that are really important to say. Remember, mm. even the conductor and all the musicians are there for the music, just like you. Yeah. So if you feel like that's an issue and there's a proper balance, you have to discuss it. So mm. um, I would say asking Sometimes if the conductor might be willing, for example, would you mind if you listen to a section from the audience perspective just to hear what do you think? Because from, from where I'm sitting, I'm feeling myself, you know, not so hurt. I'm playing as loud as I can where mm. it's, you know, safe for the instrument still. Yeah. Um, I think you've got to navigate these things very gently, but you have to navigate them. Because okay. what happens otherwise is, is you literally are not being heard. And what happens is it can backfire on you. Mm. Uh, I always find that uh, sometimes these sort of decisions can literally make the player also the guilty one. And, and at the same time, there's no guilt whatsoever. They may say, oh, yeah. you don't have big sound. And you're saying, are you kidding with me? I am playing as loud as anybody can play without breaking this instrument. So you see how important it is to be very aware of, of this too. And obviously, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you're the concerto soloist too. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's number one. So beware that generally speaking, marimba as a wooden based instrument is going to be dark, is going to be more luscious. And whenever you have to play dynamically loud, you have a couple options. Either get a stick, which is just good enough to give you both worlds really well, soft and loud, and in the loud, it's not going to hurt the instrument, but you can really play. Another option is some people very gently amplify the marimba and they put a speaker just in front of it. Mm. So that basically, you know, you are not really overly loud, but in those loud places, it's really easy to cut through. Yeah, okay. And also, you are really far to the side in the hall. And I don't yeah. think that the acoustic body of the hall is meant to amplify that side the mm. same way it's meant to amplify its central portion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. generally. So I think that is another thing to think about. Yeah. Um, when you play concerti that are mixed, say mm -hmm. you have percussion, you have marimba, you have these kind of different domains, they're also... Um, dynamically very different yeah you need to be aware that um you know at the end of the day this is one big setup and unless mm -hmm. the music greatly changes you have to maintain certain level of volume and of density mm -hmm. so especially when you're going from percussion to the marimba be more sensitive i found that when you when you did this i watched actually more of a video uh before mm -hmm. this i wanted to check it out and sometimes you get to play the marimba more like it's percussion instrument because you're coming from the percussion setup. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of playing these different musics and these different instruments a little bit more uh, to what they really are supposed to be doing. Yeah. And if you have section that is really exciting and it's on percussion instruments, mm -hmm. when you come back to the marimba, that you can kind of suppress some of that excitement mm -hmm. enough to where you can then really play melodically if that's what the music asks you mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. I wrote a couple notes here. Uh, yes, okay. I want to talk about something which um, I'm gonna. I actually have the score here, so I'm gonna sing to you a little Great. bit too. Don't don't copy yeah. me on this. Okay. Uh, here we go. Or oh, don't quote me on this. Should I say? So 
I listened a couple times to the opening theme, right? So what's interesting about it, first of all, is if you look at the part, the first time around, it's more melodic, right? He says, play mezzo forte, but there's fewer accents in this. Then when he starts adding texture, meaning, say, measure 13, 14, he starts adding basically those octaves and fills in yeah. some of the harmony. Mm -hmm. He starts adding more of the accents themselves. Yeah. And then what happens is really cool. The accents are not predictable so much. So, for example, yeah. in the beginning, you have totally different, right? So, what Avner is doing there is, first of all, changing the articulations and changing the placement of the accents makes it less predictable for the audience, makes it more fun, more playful, more interesting, right? So, mm -hmm. when I listened to you playing, I, I felt you kind of playing this more by heart, mm -hmm. right? And, and I want to tell you, I constantly talk to my students about this. I want to do that too. And I do it. However, I add a little element before the heart comes to play this. So my, my personal suggestion when I approach all of this to myself, just to everybody who asks anything, is think first, feel second, and then play your, play your, out, your heart out and your mind out. The reason I think first is because otherwise what happens is the heart doesn't always allow me to go to my head. If you just fall in love with something, you go, well, what do I want to think about this? I'm feeling great, yeah. right? So the thing is, if you think about these things first, what you do is you're starting to basically think like a professional adult player. And that's a very different domain where I think younger players are generally beautifully exciting and you know, very earthy in that way. And I really love that raw energy. And the difference between a young player and a, and a sort of more seasoned, more refined player is that Eventually, the more refined player would just play everything with also very beautiful energy, but everything will be thought out and with a very specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you're getting that same musical experience, but in ways that are extremely sensitive to how to serve it with everything it needs from us, you know, on top of being, you know, played by heart as well. So mm -hmm. my suggestion is go through the score especially you know, when you learn the piece by, by memory, which yeah. it seems what you did here is you learn it quickly and then yeah. you took the score away a little bit. Yes, exactly. Right, right. <laughs> and so what I would do is when I memorize something, that's where I actually put the score to the side and keep it there all the time. Mm -hmm. And I kind of check on myself just to make sure I don't start playing too much by, by heart. And also yeah. I read the score away from practicing on a daily basis. Just okay. read really it like mm -hmm. a book to where you're actually trying to kind of remind yourself and catch things that normally when you're practicing they're not always in front of you anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah. So something really, really important to think about because for me, look, this is not about trying to tell you, oh, how dare you play the wrong accents. It's not about that. But see, for me is this, if you don't play the accents Avner wants, you sound more predictable. In that sense, his music sounds more predictable, but his music is actually very playful and it's very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. That's part yeah. of his humor. And so mm -hmm. for me, trying to respect that score even more adds both to him and to you. So every time I discuss these things, just like I was telling Ashley too, this is not at all about to say, you did not play this accent. That's a silly thing to say. You could probably tell that yourself. But more, mm -hmm. if you don't do something, what's the result? Or if you do something, what is the outcome? Okay? So stay closer to the score for the sake of not only serving the composer, but also realizing what are the functions of these indications and markings. And if you take them more, if you change them, what might you be gaining or sacrificing? And sometimes you may consciously say, okay, I'm not playing this accent. I'm not playing this mm -hmm. legato. Okay? But again, having thought that through, it's a very interesting conversation. And, and look, I work with a lot of composers. We do have discussions about things. Sometimes they would mark something and say, hey, look, what about if I try this slightly differently? And sometimes they do not like it. They do not agree. So, of course, you have to respect them. But yeah. uh, still, you know, you have, mm -hmm. you have that choice to communicate. Um, one last thing to tell you, um, what was really interesting uh, about the balance when you played was that even when you play softly sometimes with the orchestra, I still couldn't hear you. So uh, what I wanted to tell you maybe to simplify this in the time we have is always think about the context of what you're doing and what is supposed to be happening when someone's absor obser observing it. Mm -hmm. So. If you know you're supposed to play piano, for example, dynamic piano, and the orchestra is supporting you, you're playing a solo line. If you know they're too loud, 
you cannot continue to play in that dynamic. You have to basically make sure that the, the grand yeah. scheme of things is you are playing above them if that's a solo line and they're supporting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. always think in context. And in a rehearsal, you know, you can always tell them, could we maybe bring the volume of everybody down here a little bit? We can mm -hmm. broaden a little bit the dynamic range. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I found you even in places that were supposed to be soft, that yeah. you were still too soft. And at that places, yeah. in those places, you do have the, the range to play loud. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. something to think about always in context, you know. And mm -hmm. um, I guess I, we have maybe two minutes. Do you have anything you're curious about? Yeah, well, I think the main thing was like how to basically project because that that's that was like my my main problem. Like yeah. I I couldn't be heard, uh, but also just hmm, I'm not sure. I I also felt like I had quite a lot of difficulties with just rushing from the orchestra, and maybe that was yeah. more. Uh, more a thing of how everything was positioned. We had to leave some space for the flute player and so on that was coming on after me. Um, well, listen, and stuff. listen, you know, you, you have to be really aware of whether they can actually really hear you well as well. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes the way you were positioned, I guarantee you they could not. Mm. So that's a whole different ball game. And this is where every single concert that I play, I actually have to, I don't know, strategize a little bit on what's the best positioning, what's the best way to both sound great and communicate with the, with the ensemble. I completely hear you and listen to maybe cap it off with this. For your first performance of such kind, for dealing with COVID and distancing, I think you're rocked. Thanks. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Keep on this and I really look forward to being able to hear you in live sometime. Thank you. Thank you as well. Round of applause for Philip. Awesome. Fabulous stuff. So we're going to roll on now. Uh, Greg, I believe. Where's Greg? Here he is. He's got a Hello. scarf on today. So <laughs> I'm not going to Sorry. I'm not going to tell you what it looks like outside here in Miami right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sun is out. Everybody's out. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, or, I, or actually, I cannot imagine. Yeah. <laughs> actually, well, for all it's worth, your scarf is beautiful. <laughs> all right, great. So um, we are going to have a little bit of Merlin, I think. Yes. All being well. So um, yeah, let's do it. Tim, let's please do this because it's two movements. Uh, what if we just play maybe up to the, the climax of the piece, which is about halfway in? Sure. You, um, yeah. and then, I'll, I'll text you. Sounds if good. you wave, wave at me, then I'll, I'll yeah. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Uh, let's get this up.
Can you hear me? I cannot hear you. Ah, uh, yes, I muted myself. Sorry. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Forgive me. Uh, very well done. I, I just wanted to maybe share a couple ideas with you. So this is an interesting, I want to take different angles for every person I work with because you're hearing also what I'm talking about. You can borrow ideas, right? This, I'd like to talk a little bit about psychology. Okay. So when you think about roles on marimba, what do you associate them with in the sense of the sonics, the sounds? I'm not sure if I understood your question, actually, but... Uh... So, so I'm, I'm going to basically think out loud. So, roles yeah. are technically mm -hmm. supposed to be sustains, right? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. But at the same time, think about a string instrument sustaining a sound. And think about now a percussionist sustaining a sound. Mm -hmm. Do you notice psychologically how different they feel? One is just really, really active all the time in a way which is, I think, almost overworking and another one can be just very simply active in a much more natural way and for me in this movement especially in the very early bits of it that activity sometimes can create tension with a player psychologically mm -hmm. because even though we're supposed to be uh, sounding you know very lyrically and and sustain these sounds we are working under the hood very actively all the time mm -hmm. and Psychologically, even though the listener hears ta -dum, -da, you're hearing ta -dum, you're working, -dig 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 you know, there's something about that that is still reflected in our mechanism. You're the one playing, you know, mm -hmm. and I feel that I hear some of that tension in, in the first bit of the piece. Um, I'm going to give you a couple examples. Uh, if you listen later, I mean, and, and this is just my opinion, I think you're doing really good work, but. I find that you get too loud sooner mm -hmm. than I would personally. And that's one way I feel that you have some of that, you're, you're experiencing some of this tension. Because, you know, it, again, it's making you work. It's making you a little anxious. It, it does so to every person. It's psychological. So think about how can you counter, for example, such tension if you do feel like you feel it. And also whether it really might be the one that pushes you to crescendo a little too soon, in my opinion at least. Or is this something that's intentional? And if it is very intentional what you're doing, then leave it as is. And if not, consider what you want to do. Another example to give you uh, specifically is if you look at measure 12 to measure 13, mm -hmm. yep. I don't think you want to wait for those couple rests as much as they're needed there. Dun. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. The reason yeah. for that partially is exactly from the same, I think, tension I talk about. So a couple, couple things that maybe I have found that can really help here. First of all, remember that this is a slow movement. Mm -hmm. So anytime you have rests and long values, embrace them. Technically speaking, those silences are literally the canvas on which you paint. You cannot make a painting if you don't have those canvases, those silences. You cannot make sound without those silences. So they're part of the sound, if you will. They're the reason the sound comes across the way it does. So think of them as, a, as part of the music. Mm -hmm. and, and allow them to be just as powerful to you as, as the sounds are. You know? It's almost like feeling those silences as if without them, this piece <clears throat> won't work anymore, you know? Um, another thing to, to consider here is the long values. I think sometimes you crescendo in them or you stop them a little, a little sooner because I think you, you get to the very peaks of them a little bit too quickly. So again, because it's a slow movement, I have one word for you and that is patience. Patience. It's very hard to do. It's easier said than done. The older you become, the better you'll become at being patient, just because we all do it as a people too, you know? Um, but, you know, I always find that with this new generation you guys are, and you're just smarter and wiser and more informed than the previous generation in many ways. And I think that even knowing that would help you tremendously. Just being aware of that. If you record yourself, watch yourself one more time playing and ask yourself, am I really pacing this as patiently as I could for what this movement is, you will already respond. You'll find your own ways to, 
to respond to that. Um, um, one or two other little details about this movement. Um, I found I found your rolling to be uh, very expressive, but maybe there is a couple of little tricks that can add some extra nuance to you. So, mm -hmm. how do you feel about the speed of the roll uh, versus the volume of the roll? So, for example, I know you're already dynamically very expressive with your rolls. What about the speed of the rolls? I mean, of course, it depends in which register. Yeah, that's that's for sure. Or, but. I mean, difficult question again, <laughs> but uh, um, I mean, if I want to be, if I want to be in the bass register, more, much more intense, much more, uh, if I want to show much, much more intense, I would play a bit faster and in a different, um, in the different part of the bar. That's for sure. Okay. So, so I hear you. And, and so you are thinking about these as variables. Let me try to, again, because of the time we have, let me try to kind of share a, maybe a simple way to look into all of this together. Mm -hmm. So the speed of the roll is to me personally, less related to a register and it's just more related to the expression of what it does. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. Different contexts will make this easier or mm -hmm. harder. I think, for example, you could be in any register and change the speed of the roll if you have the correct tools. Like, for example, if the mallet favors that register, if the phrase allows it, you know, it could be many things. But yeah. let's assume that you have the right mallet and you're in the right register and you can manipulate speeds. To me, the speed of the roll is the same thing as the infliction of how you and I speak right now. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not about volume. It's about expressivity of how we say the things we do, besides how loud or how soft. It's the same thing as what the speed of a singer in their vibrato can change throughout a sustained note is like. So in other words, I try to keep all the various musical expression details completely independent from each other. So in this case, the speed of the role for me can add tremendous amount of vibrancy to something, even if the volume stays the same. Mm -hmm. And the speed of the roll can almost simulate intensification of volume and even color, you know, because, because maybe you don't want to change these two, but you want to add something. So in that sense, explore the speed of the roll when you play, especially uh, the, the, the very sort of maybe first third of the piece and the last third of the piece. I think your central part is pretty, pretty much expressive as it is already in a ways that you're utilizing everything you can work with. But, for example, you catch yourself when you're playing, when you crescendo, a lot of times the speed stays the same, but the volume changes. Mm -hmm. And my question is, if now we're discussing this and you go back and you examine some of this, wouldn't you want to actually sometimes substitute or supplement or combine them in ways where actually if you want to intensify without getting much louder, what else can I do instead of you know, getting louder? Can I maybe try to add some speed instead of only volume? Would that allow me to make that opening kind of more patiently crescendoing and kind of that beautiful long phrase that goes all the way to pom ti ra, you know? Mm -hmm. Can I basically pace that better because I'm also utilizing the speed of my roll differently? So sometimes instead of getting louder, my question is, can you try to utilize varying speeds of rolls? And sometimes when you want to be expressive, what if you don't use as much dynamic only but you actually combine the use of raw, especially when you're trying to decrescendo and trying to taper phrases. The stick you have clearly allows you to slow down the rolls at the very soft ends of them, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can lose density and tension if you do that as well, well you know, with speed, just not, not just with volume. So explore that a little bit. I think it's a very living expression tool that I think can be a huge benefit to you here in addition to your dynamic range. Um, let's see, how much time do we have to, should we go to the second movement? Let's see. Yeah, you got about five minutes. Uh, of total? Uh, yeah, I think so, five, six okay. minutes. Let's go into the second movement so we can talk a little bit more uh, about that movement too. Could we? Okay, sure. So just ca carry on. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, I have one more thing just to say to you. Um, when you change role positions, speaking purely technically, 
Do mm-hmm. you consciously decide which voice leads always? Yeah, at least I'm trying to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I was not sure whether I heard right, but sometimes I felt like the changes were coming from bass, yet the melody was in soprano voices. So if I'm wrong, forgive me. But if you're already telling me that you're looking into this always, then I know you're I, aware. At least, at least I'm trying to think about it. But of course, yeah. it was difficult to control in this movement because because it is. Uh, kind of difficult as we know but you know and this is where actually it's funny you say this that's where actually sometimes uh varying the speeds of things for example i'm going to give you an example i'm going to sing and i'm going to play okay Mm -hmm. so if you're doing something and you need to make a if you're playing a a chord and you're trying to change that chord you can actually stretch the speed of the rolling exactly where sometimes there's complications and allow yourself a very musical transition so for example you listen do you hear this Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's ways to almost kind of sweeten transitions instead of run into them if they're tricky. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand. But actually, I was doing it before. I mean, I played this piece almost two years from now. And sure. I did it on the beginning. And I had a few, few lessons with the other people as well. And then they're always, they were always saying to me that too much slowing down before, slowing down before, before the difficult places, it also kind of like breaking the phrase. And that yes. was also my, my tension as well, to yes. continue the phrase. And of course, maybe sometimes it's, it sounds a bit weird, but my intention was to, to make kind of the, the one huge phrase without stopping before the, the chords changing. Right, so, right. So, so two things to say to you. First of all, you will always have different opinions and that's the beauty of this, you know? But, but hear me out. Actually, what I'm saying is that you break after the first time you actually get to a more challenging place, not before it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and with, with the first stroke you make, not with both hands. That's very different. Second of all, I think that there's always variables of how much is too much and how little is too little. So that's where I feel, you know, I, I tell my students always the same thing. Everything I do is pretty much not black or white. It's gray, different shade of gray, because it's literally coming to those details. You know, as I talked about earlier, too, with compromise or decisions, you're absolutely right. If you overdo anything, it would almost kind of interfere, right? So mm-hmm. no matter what it is, I would say think in those shades of middle ground and figure out where you can use it. And as you said, sometimes where it just doesn't work. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Let's play with the second one. Tim, could you could you uh, go forward uh, to the second one? Yeah, I'll try. I'm not quite sure where. It... Uh, even if you, even if, I'm even quite if sure where it is, but let's yeah. see. I can probably help with that. That's good. That's fine. Okay, cool. So uh, a couple things I wanted to say to you here. Um, you know, I always tell uh, all my students, also my friends too, you know, when you play a piece that a lot of people play, you know, sometimes don't listen too much. <laughs> because this way, you can, this way you can create your own version of the piece. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, pianists probably have it the most difficult where you play uh, Chopin piano ballad, you know, a lot of people play <laughs> Chopin piano ballad, you know. So yeah. um, one thing I, dis- I-, I-, I kind of get a sense of here is you- your playing is great. I find this to be more rhythmic than melodic. If I can basically compare the two, 
right now your rhythmic is here and your melodic is here. And I think this movement actually really needs both. Here's why I say mm -hmm. that to you. Because the choice of mallet you made is really good. Your mallet does create a rhythm for you, no problem. So I find that because of that, you kind of have the ability to sing out more. So for example, uh, if you think about it, I feel a bit more of this right now. So it's very groovy, but I'm listening. I, I wish I would hear more of I think, do you have a background at all in playing any drums or drum set or things like that? Yeah, I, I, I actually started my, my uh, percussion you know, adventure with the drums. Yes, I'm guilty of charging the same thing. And one thing that we can fall into a trap is you catch a groove like that on a piece, you go like, oh, I'm in a groove, right? Groove, but don't forget that this is a melodic piece. And because the stick already gives you that articulation and the groove is already happening naturally, I would go more into the singing part of the piece and worry about the phrasing in addition. So I'm not saying don't groove as much. I'm saying sing out as much as you're grooving, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a, a hint to help you here is think long-term phrases and use your left hand to help you play melodically as well. Right now, I think the left hand sometimes really supports you, but sometimes it kind of goes and stays away while the right mm -hmm. hand is playing melodic lines, right? So use maybe just a little bit more balance in that. That's the main thing I was going to say. I feel like you, you do a great job, at least from what I'm hearing. This movement naturally wants to be too rhythmic as it is. So don't fall into the trap of becoming overly rhythmic with it because it already okay. is that way anyway. Yeah? Okay. Sweet. Good work, man. Really good work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Lovely. Thanks, Greg. Uh, where are you? A lot of people in the stream tonight. Okay, so we're going to move over to Israel now for the Balagan duo. This is Yuval and Shalev. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey. Hey. Yes. And um, they're going to be playing part two of Marimba Spiritual, if that's mm. all right, the second half. Awesome. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. For time, we may stop by just a little bit again, but... Sure, just give me a wave as ever.
All right. Even even now when you guys watching this, you probably get a little sweat, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's just a lot of work you guys have done on this. It's obviously really well done. And congratulations on, on this. Do you guys work with uh, Tomer? Yeah. yeah. I can tell. <laughs> yes, he's, I'm, I'm a huge fan of him. And congratulations to him as well for this and everything he's doing. You know, uh, Such a great player, great person. So, um, you know, you are able to work with someone who you know, intimately understands uh, the art of percussion, chamber music playing, who understands what's it like to play this particular piece. Um, so what I could do is probably just give you another perspective because you already have a really great one. Um, and maybe I can throw in a couple of ideas from a different angle, if you will. So yeah, we'd like that. There is three, there's three different general kinds of music in here that I want to address. There's a lot more stuff going on. Um, the music that basically is the theme and basically all of the music which has that density, that, that energy. I find personally that I'm missing a little bit of bright red color on the upper register of the marimba. I don't think this, this music is made to be meant to be really beautiful or pretty in any sense, you know? Yeah. And I remember the first time I heard Mrs. Abe play, you know, uh, in the States, uh, when I came here, she played a, a concert and I was just blown away by many, many things. But one of which was, you know, I did not think you can go and play the marimba without my sound and get these bright reds out of the instrument, this brightness and intensity. And it was not always super aggressive. It was just really bright and really intense. Yeah. And why I say that is because partially, you know, when you're playing the marimba with, with both metals and skins like you are, you know, you have to compete with that sound, no matter how softly your colleague can play, which you, know, you guys are doing a great job. I think you have to compete with that, but also you have to kind of contribute to that a little bit more. And right now, to my ear, I find this to blend more than to actually contribute to it, you know? Um, I feel like it's beautiful what you have done. And I wonder if you want to explore pushing the color a little bit of the marimba even brighter than that. Maybe it could be the microphone too. And maybe you guys are sounding exactly like that and I'm just you know, not able to hear it, that's totally fine. But I'm thinking to myself, what if you think of this first section of the piece even a little brighter? Again, I'm talking about the upper register of the marimba, you really can do that. To where you are not necessarily only worried about the volume, but you're worried about the, the power and the, the sort of the density and the, that sort of intensity the, the, the almost like the, the visceral experience that that brings in itself as a sound. I would definitely want to go in that direction, which would allow you, when you go into the second part of that piece that basically is with a softer stick and playing a little softer, sweeter, to really have a bigger contrast. And, and I think that would be an interesting thing to try to achieve. Um, I know that, especially when you're playing between wood, which is the marimba, and basically all the rest, it's already hard to create balance. And one little trick that might be able to help, especially the percussion part here, is this. I don't know if you guys ever tried this. In the States, people do it a lot. And I actually have come to like some of it in some occasions. So maybe I'll share it with you. Uh, do you know what uh, this product is? It's called moleskin. Do you know what that is? Yeah, I have, yeah. Uh, I have heard of it, yeah. Right. So it basically looks like, a, it's basically like little stickers that are like suede. And they, it comes in different thicknesses. So sometimes when people are playing on a lot of different surfaces, like for example, on metal and then on wood and then on skins, they will put a little bit of that moleskin on, on the wooden sticks, like you're playing with wood sticks, right? Are playing to balance sticks, right? Yeah. Right. What They'll put a, right. And they will put a little bit of that. And what happens is if you want to play really, really softly, if that layer is very thin, you can do that but not really affect too much the quality of the sounds you're making. So it's almost like a slight version of a multi-tone stick for drums. Yeah. And I think the reason I say that is because sometimes I think your dynamic range can improve even more. You guys can offer even more of that, which you're already doing an amazing job. But you can do even more if you have these ways to literally almost disappear, yeah. which I know with the speed of playing right now, it's extremely hard to do. I mean, what you're doing is excellent. 
But this way is one way you can try to broaden the spectrum on both sides, because if you do that, then the marimba also can go up and down a little bit more with you, okay? So something yeah, to think yeah. about. Um, Interesting. One, one other part I wanted to ask you about, and this is really interesting. I know that you guys can play together really, really well, but if I have to be really picky, I think because you can play so well, you can play even better together. So my question is, why do you generally look at each other very few times? And what do you think about the idea of visual communication between two players? Like, what do you think? Uh, actually, it's an interesting question. And uh, I even would like to comment back on uh, your suggestion uh, before, earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, when we study the piece, and uh, I did my arrangement for the percussion uh, part, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a written arranger arrangement by Tomer or other other percussionists. I just took the scores and did uh, whatever felt right, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we came to a, a conclusion that uh, when it's two percussionists and not an ensemble, mm -hmm. it's more of a, a duo and not a marimba solo piece. So I'm quite intentionally uh, not trying to play as soft as possible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to give some sort of a blend and fight not fight the marimba but not making but the more marimba sound. is like a percussion instrument like mm -hmm. on the on the three yeah. that was some mm -hmm. sort of uh, one part of our philosophy when we played it yes for yes. sure and it and uh, actually it might be interesting to play it more as written the, the well, is a solo instrument, yeah. But you know, I think your idea is also extremely original. My suggestion is what would happen if you combined the two ideas? Because I think your idea of also having that friction and not always trying to give space to the marimba, it's also very interesting. I think everything is about, uh, you know, the context. Where would one work better than the other? For example, when yeah. the marimba needs more space, I would give it because there's something really powerful about playing very softly and very quickly like you are. There's some... Yeah, I love I love quiet tension. I'm like yeah. a huge fan of it. When you're like, like where I can't yeah. breathe, I'm sitting here like, <laughs> you know. But at the same time, places where you say, you know what, I totally want to play against the marimba rather than with it, then you have the space to do that as well. And look, maybe you discover that what you already are doing is what you want to go for. But I find that that variety might help you guys to create even more powerful impact when it comes to the soft end of this. Because right now where you're strong is at the loud end. Mm -hmm. And I think in the soft end, the question is how can you be equally, equally powerful? That's the question. And you know, look, this is a, the question I would ask just as myself as I'm asking you when I'm playing something like this. I know it's very tricky. So just explore it a little bit. I think it's, you know, they say always the truth's in the middle somewhere. Yeah. Always. Actually, yeah, actually I think that uh, the truth uh, lies in the middle. Uh, it's not make, when I uh, think of, rethink it, it doesn't make any sense to push against the marimba in the first few bars uh, in the introduction. But uh, mm -hmm. definitely when uh, my parts get uh, interesting, uh, it's an, a good idea to use our approach. Uh, right, you know? exactly. Yeah, and what happens like is... Right, right, right. Exactly right. And the whole That's idea right. is how can, how can we serve the music as best as we can with this arrangement? Because also, this is an arrangement. So yeah. that, that actually, that, what I love about this arrangement is that it creates a tremendous amount of intimacy. You know, it's very, I always talk to my friends saying, you know, duo is the most vulnerable way of playing chamber music, literally. And there's something really powerful about this. So, which is why I wish sometime, honestly, that you would actually, when you start, for example, playing the marimba and the percussion, when this, when this starts playing together, I really wish you guys would play literally and look at each other and play together. Literally play together. Like play with one yeah. another as if you're talking to each other. It's actually yeah. another another decision that we made, uh, and it's connecting even to the cadenza we made. Yes. Uh, we we felt that this piece has a lot uh, more strength to it. When uh, we feel each other, not by too much looks and marks and giving each other like a kind of a marking uh, vibe to each other, like, and we sure. are starting. So it's kind of a conscious uh, uh, decision. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And another thing that, uh, uh, and hon uh, really honest with you, that uh, both my part and Yuval's marimba part is really, really difficult, and because this is such a masterpiece, and although it's it's an arrangement, we are. Uh, aspiring to be as accurate we can and some sort close to the original score so yes we are uh, really want to uh, make a respect to this piece and try to get the parts as although we arranged it and took it to our uh, direction to really try and respect the notes and uh, not miss any of the <laughs> so, yes really no, of course yeah Listen, I, I'm 100% with you. So let me tell you what I'm talking about, though. That's different yeah. from what you're saying a little bit. All so right. I don't think... You're absolutely correct. I don't think that you need any sort of... Let me cue you of where the next eight note is. You know yeah. where that is. But the kind of communication I talk about is the communication that empowers two people to do something together beyond what they hear. For example, do you know how when you talk to people when you lock eyes with them, when you have eye contact, there is a certain level of bond between them that is yeah. not the same. It's not that you can talk to people, you know, you can talk to them without looking at them. But there's something about that moment when you can really feel like you connect with a person. And my idea is this. Okay. Sometimes you want to play with a person. Sometimes you want to play against them. Sometimes you want to bond with them. And sometimes you want them to hunt you. And I feel like we are kind of agreeing on something really interesting. Again, I love the fact that in your cadenza, you don't look at each other. But that's the idea. That's where you explore the, that, that, that moment of, of unity and, and yeah. sort of we're part of one and we, we, we feel each other. You know, we, you know, we're touching backs here and we're just going to play this as one person with four hands. Yeah. But I feel like there's something really powerful on the opposite spectrum of that as yeah. well, where... You know, we have these interesting conversations again recently with my studio too. You know, when people, regardless, for example, let's put aside how we think is performance. When people listen to music and the lights are on, they're going to watch. And I am the last person who will talk to you about a spectacle. You know, I really, as you guys think too, and I think as all of us do, we're trying to serve the music with everything we've got. Yeah. But, sure. but there is a moment where actually because of how you bond, the audience bonds with you. And just as powerful as it is, when you play your cadenza, and you are, again, turned away from one another and you're reading each other's minds, which is awesome, there's something really powerful when you do the opposite. So my question is, yeah. maybe it's worth to explore. And, and you know, for me, this is not about cueing each other. This is about getting the energy of one another. You know, when I look yeah. at someone, I go like, da da you know, There'll be places yeah, where you're going to say, okay, for the life of me, I'm not looking at you here or I'm going to miss. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. I think we we both kind of realized what you're meaning. And uh, yeah. I think uh, I personally came to a conclusion that the right thing maybe to try and do uh, when we are uh, working on this piece again for a next performance or mm -hmm. something is to really understand like came to an understanding that this piece is so much complicated and because mm -hmm. it's na uh, natural complicity we can show all of the spectrums of uh, what we talked about that there's a moment <laughs> there are really nice moments that even a uh, first topic that we talked about there are really yes. nice moments that the marimba needs to be the star of the show and and uh, rings a uh, ring above the percussion, and there are moments that it should be a really a duo and kind of interlocks more. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate your opinion and think that there are moments that we should look and feel each other, and there are moments that we are not. And I think yes. because this piece is even as a really nice length to it, the mm -hmm. the second part is ten minutes approximately, mm -hmm. I believe, even maybe nine. Uh, in those nine minutes or ten minutes, we can show a lot of our uh, musical spectrum. So I really, absolutely, really appreciate I, your uh, your uh, input on this. Uh, I mean, and, and I'm grateful that you guys are also open to explore. I feel like at the end of the day, it all comes to what can we do to serve the piece of music we're playing. And then there's different opinions too. Yeah. I always find that that, uh, as I was saying earlier, it's always different shades of gray. It's never black and white. Yeah. And yeah. the truth is, the truth is in this case. 
sometimes you may try a couple of things and go, oh, yeah, this is too much. You know, we can simplify because I, I always want to simplify everything to its most fundamental musical message. Mm-hmm. I always joke with my students, you know, look, like I, I showed them my phone and I said, this is very complicated device, but it's really simple looking. And I'm trying to think the same way about pretty much all, all, we, all I do. What we do is not simple at all. And how can it come across to the audience? For example, in this case, you're playing a piece which is playing, you know, this music just two of you. It's extremely more difficult, right? Yet, yeah. how can we make this feel like it's not a big deal? That's already really hard, right? Yeah. And everything else when it comes to, okay, the spectrums. Okay, where can we make the marimba come really across? How can we basically bring richness to the balance and keep the balance changing all the time? Where is it too much, you know? But for me, the idea is this, the sky's the limit. And I'll tell you this, you know, you guys are doing a really fantastic job. And what I love about you both is, is something that I also try to do myself, which is that you stay open-minded about something even when you've learned it. And that's really important. That's the beautiful thing about our job is when you finish learning something, you actually are not done at all. You're just getting started. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm sure throughout your life, you may find that different decisions you make which may change. And that's part of the beauty. But at the end of the day, no matter what, I send you a big hug from America and I say that this is awesome and I'm so excited to hear you guys play it and I hope to meet you in person sometime, definitely. Yeah, definitely. We'll hope to meet you too. Yeah. Yes, Thanks yes, for... thank you. Thank you. Was really Absolutely. To hear. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. Same, same. Lovely, great. All right, so we say goodbye to Tel Aviv and we go to Germany for... Nozomi next is going to be performing. Uh, Hi, Nozomi. Hi. I should really know this beforehand. Dance is the first and fire. Thank you. Sp- <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> yeah, you always got my back. That's great. Nice one. All right. So let's have a little listen to this. Thank you. 
Thank you. We're stopping only because of time, Nozomi. Uh, so, uh, a couple of things. You, you're doing a great job. This, you know, in my opinion, this piece is probably one of the most different pieces for marimba. You know, it's kind of in its own league with very few other pieces. I remember the first time I tried learning this piece and I was literally sitting going, what do I do with this piece? Yeah. I did not have any idea what to do. I don't know how you felt. I was also like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's weird. So, so I want to tell you a couple of things that can really help, uh, you know, kind of start, you know, a relationship with a piece maybe that, that helped me. Maybe you can use some of that as well. So first of all, um, did you have a chance to talk to Peter Klasso yet? Did you okay. talk to him? No, actually not. Okay. So definitely get a hold of him. You can find him on, on Facebook. I think he is, I, I, as far as I remember, I think I'd seen something from him. Uh, I hope his health is okay, but I had seen him um, mm -hmm. on Facebook still some uh, recently. So when you have a composer, especially who is, you know, a contemporary, you know, try, try to get a hold of them and to ask them as much as you can. It's a really priceless opportunity to find out uh, what uh, basically they thought and what their priorities were. And things that normally are never going to be written in the score, but they'll tell you. A um, couple of things to share with you. He is a student of Nadia Boulanger, which mm. is incredible. Uh, and um, I personally find him fascinating in many, many ways. He's an incredibly smart person and I don't know just so uh, so witty and uh, I think inspired by impressionism uh, quite a bit I think uh, very knowledgeable about a lot of different topics about art uh, visual art um, so with this piece uh, one thing I would suggest is try and explore inspirations outside percussion I would definitely look into paintings I would definitely listen to some piano music um, I would also just learn a little bit more about uh, sort of his inspirations during this time and just try to listen to some of that. That could help you tremendously. Um, more specifically about the piece. Um, you know, when I opened the score the first time, I remember seeing he's just dark and heavy, mm. right? And I, I thought to myself, and now this is literally a thing I do all the time too and tell everybody to do as my students, is how do I play so it sounds like that? Mm -hmm. So can you tell me in your words, for example, what are the things you're trying to do in the beginning of the piece to play dark and heavy, to come across that way? You know, yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> so for me, dark and heavy, it was a little bit difficult because I can see that I have to play pianissimo but still, I have to play heavy and dark. Well, but, but so let me ask you something. Do you feel like the volume and the articulation or the weight are sort of fully connected or you feel like they can be independently adjusted, like I was talking earlier about Merlin? Um, not every time. Go ahead. Uh, not every time, but in this case, it was a little bit difficult. I don't know why, but... Hmm, not every time it depends on, I think. And I try to play a, a little bit louder mm -hmm. with left, left, left hand. Mm -hmm. So I try to play right hand near the string and mm -hmm. left hand I try to play near the a middle of the bar. Mm -hmm. So maybe a suggestion is explore different beating areas of the stick. So right now you're basically using the stick pretty much directly. I would play a lot with the angle of the stick and mm -hmm. actually seeing how much yarn versus how much bowl do I put into the bars I play with. And sometimes these are literally like shades of the same stick. You know how you can have different shades of a color? The sound of your stick can have shades too if you manipulate it in different ways too. So I can explore that a little bit. Maybe it can help. In this, I found that generally, for my taste, the the way you begin the whole movement felt to me more active than what the movement asks you to do. Dark and heavy, the stroke, and I think you got basically you were trying to be respectful to the staccato, I'd imagine, right? Because they're written all over the place, right? Mm. But I, I I then become the devil's advocate, as they say, 
It is a staccato, but it's quarter notes. A lot of them are quarters. So if you play the staccato so short, you're not playing the length of the notes, mm -hmm. right? So then the mm -hmm. question is, what are the staccato supposed to do and how can you play both of them? Right? So mm -hmm. here's a way to think about it. And here's where I would say that definitely begs to ask Peter, hey, what were you thinking? You know, mm -hmm. how did you, what did you mean, right? So you definitely can, but also let's think out loud for a second. So one way you can think about this is he's saying, okay, I know that the marimba is going to murmur if it plays very softly, right? So mm -hmm. he's saying, please don't ghost this so much. I want to hear it. So I think the staccatos for him are sort of a way of saying, don't, don't let the marimba sort of be so soft that we lose the actual gravity of what you're doing. But at the same time, be dark and heavy, right? Mm. So, so try to find maybe a way to split the difference and to come back a little bit from, from the staccato and to find a little bit more weight. I'll, I'll give you an example. So one way to play this, if you're not playing from here, T, ta 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 versus T. Do you see, do you see that mechanism? Mm, you can yeah. utilize some of the heavy from actual a larger portion of your body and use your arms to just kind of give the message to the marimba and then use your wrist for some of the articulations, mm -hmm. right? So that's another way you can approach this. But think of it this way. Every time when you're having these kind of descriptions to yourself, like, you know, totally no one needs to know what you're saying, but to yourself say, I'm playing dark and heavy by doing this, 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 and that, right? So for example, like what we're discussing right now, say if you want to play heavy, well, I'm using a little bit more weight for my mechanism, right? I'm playing darker, as you said, because I'm utilizing more of the low register, in this case, left hand, and a little less of the right hand, which is a little bit, you know, higher right register, brighter. What else are the things one can do in these cases? So think about those things. But mm -hmm. generally, you know, I, I give this example often. Also, it's about how you prepare yourself to play this. Mm -hmm. Right now, I, I think that your demeanor right now physically is more active mm -hmm. than what the piece, I think, needs in the opener. This is kind of more of a key. Dun, ti, da. Ya. Dun, ti, da. Da, ti. Da. Ti. Ya, da. This is, remember, this is the dance of the earth, right? This is something that's going to have that sort of holiness to it. Mm -hmm. It's going to have that sort of depth and I feel like that's what he's saying by dark and heavy. I so, see. so find maybe a slightly more close to that description approach, literally by yourself, by being there, the way you play everything. And mm -hmm. I think you might find it easier to do the things you're doing because by default, you already are that, you know, mm -hmm. I tell my students often when we look for sounds, I almost think of, I want to be the sound I want to sound, you know? Mm -hmm. So what can I do to really channel what I want to sound like? What can I do to literally live the sounds I want to make? Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, again, as I told you, you have to be really specific to yourself. Mm -hmm. That's not something that's just, oh, I, you know, something intangible. I want it actually, as musicians, we need to be also technicians, right? We need mm -hmm. to tell ourselves. But, but I think that I will start with those two ideas, you know? Yeah. Okay. And, and so I think you're doing beautiful work. I just thought that could even further let you delve into that character of the dark and heavy. Um, when you play these, these couple of phrases, so say, say, for example, I know maybe people don't have score, but if they're curious, they can look up. Can you tell me, in your opinion, uh, the first phrase, bom, ta -tirom, bom, ta -tirom, ta -ram -ti, where does the first phrase end for you? Just fast by you mean, or the just fast phrases? So, I mean, let's say not just a measure, but say a couple of measures. Where where would be the first time where you feel like, okay, I can take a breath for a second? The first note, note of um, three, bar three, I think. Bar three. That's, to me, personally, that's actually where the phrase peaks. Mm -hmm. So I want to give you an example. And again, again, that's why I said in your opinion, because you can disagree with me and I respect that tremendously. We all are different, uh, you know, opinions. We, we have different interpretation. That's the beauty of this. Mm -hmm. So, for example, let me tell you one way I, I would look into this and maybe you can explore your way of thinking of this. So oh, for me, is, bad now. is it bad? Uh oh. Hello? Uh-oh. 
<laughs> I've been there too. We've all been there. You're muted, buddy. No, it's your turn now. It's my turn now. <laughs> freeze frame, freeze frame. Freeze frame. Uh, sure, return, I'm sure. It, do you know what? It was going so well. I jinxed it earlier, didn't I? Never no, mind. no, you did not jinx it by all means. Well, no. thank you for this insight. Like, incredible masterclass so far. Honestly, very good. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a treat. And, you know, uh, just just uh, for us as we're speaking here, you know, I mean, uh, you've had some really fantastic, uh, you know, members of the group and i think everybody's also doing such a wonderful job and so thank you as well for creating something like this you know i actually posted something today saying i mean this is covid still the whole world is still trying to figure out how to function and yeah. i don't know how much time you guys took to make this work but you did make it happen yeah. that's yeah. that's serious that's serious yeah. thank you yeah i've been yeah. talking to a lot of, a lot of people that are going to PASIC next week and i'm very jealous i bet you're one wondering- <laughs> I bet you're one of those as well. Yes, I'm going to buy a ticket. I still have not made any arrangements because I, I literally just returned to myself from travel. But I, I will try to go and see a couple of friends uh, perform and then, you know, just say hello to many friends who are going to be yeah. there too. Yeah, time it's surreal. To, time to catch up with a few people, I guess. Yeah, right. What a concept, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yes, but soon, soon will be the, the case for everybody. I'm sure that, you know, hopefully in the next couple of months, things will start returning. Right, well, yeah, whilst, whilst we're waiting for Nozomi to check back in, just a couple of households, which I was going to do at the end, but I may as well do now. Um, so don't forget the um, WPG First Showcase concert. Very exciting. That's going to be at 8.30 UTC time, which is in about 105 minutes. So uh, check back for that one. And tomorrow, um, we've got another dear friend, Pius Chung, is going to come on and uh, give another session on um, some Ginisteria. There's an amazing Ginisteria arrangement, some Alborada del Grazio. So there's a, a brand new commission as well. And we've got some Merlin and Red Moon, which is written by Pius as well. So looking forward to that session as well. I'm going to bring everyone back in now um, and just oh, h- hold about. Is she... Hello. Sorry, I, Sorry, I, I, as you were. Are you there, guys? Yeah. Oh, okay, I can hear you. Sounds good. I can hear you now. Good. I like the background. This is awesome. <laughs> Photos. Yeah. Photos. Yes. Yes. Uh, so um, I will just kind of pick up where we left off just because of time. Um, so here is, here's something to think about. For me, for example, one way to think about the phrasing is that at least there's a pause in the phrasing mm-hmm. after the gesture measure four. So, mm-hmm. so when, I'm, when I'm playing this piece, one thing I'm constantly thinking about is where am I going to? Where is the peak? and how to sustain that momentum, how to sustain the energy. So, for example, knowing where the peak of the phrase is, I'll be really sensitive of not to lose the phrase in the silences, right? Because if I do something like this, team, dan tiro, team, I can lose these ideas being connected. So, hmm, dan tiro, hmm. ti, so it's like you're thinking slowly and speaking slowly, but you are making one sentence, mm-hmm. right? Dagadam, bira, mm-hmm. you know. So thinking about how can you sustain these gestures into larger thoughts rather than, I know they're very separated in some ways. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's trying to figure out, and that's kind of where I think also this becomes a little bit more lyrical. Because if they're isolated, can be a little bit more rhythmic and for themselves. Yeah. So one thing to think about. Another thing I wanted to share with you is about uh, the next section. So that starts at measure 14. So think of this music a little bit more like an anthem. You know, mm-hmm. it's more vocal. Uh, and in that sense, if you notice, there are certain places where... Uh, it's very kind of gesturally awkward, you know? So 
this is almost kind of finding how can a voice do this? And how can I try to interpret that as a player, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one very really easy way to play, or not easy, but like one really natural way to play this and to tell yourself, you know, how you really want to do it is by singing to yourself and mm -hmm. playing it at the same time and just trying to catch how is my voice doing this. So, yum chi. Right? So the whole thing is really unresolved, right? It's an anthem, but it's also a cry. It's not really something that's very sort of steady vertically and having these sort of downbeats all the time. It's very very human and so I found it to be a really powerful way to, to kind of find out how to play it by singing it to myself and try to literally play all the articulations play all the phrasings and try to see what is my voice helping me to do here um, so something you can do now this phrase starts at measure 14 and goes all the way through measure 20 uh, 28 It's a really long phrase. So it starts mm -hmm. at 14. So basically, whatever from the beginning until this phrase begins, now the next phrase is that long. So think about how can you keep pushing this phrase forward. And you know, decrescendi, for example, in 24, uh, later in 27, don't lose that phrase yet. You know? mm. So now let's keep pushing that phrase. One of the hardest things about this piece, I think, is how long the phrases are and the fact that there is sort of long spaces of either silence or of sound, and you have to keep sustaining those phrases with those long sounds or long rests. You know? mm. So one, one way to do, do this is to make sure, first of all, that you do not lose too much sound, say, in this section until the very end of the phrase. And secondly, maybe that in those long moments, you don't lose activity, you know, knowing that the phrase is not over. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. um, Let's go to the second moment just for a second, Tim. Like, could we do like two minutes of it? Yeah, absolutely. Thank um, you so much. I'm going to completely guess here. Yeah, so... guess, guess somewhere. I want to see what your guess is. I, I want to go a little earlier. Okay, cool. So, uh, I think, I know this is a very, very difficult piece to play too, and I think you're doing a great job with this piece. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very wild, very wild piece to tackle because psychologically, this piece puts much more weight on the player than what the listener may expect, right? Yeah. To say that you are distressed when you play this piece, as I would be too, it's, it's an understatement, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Gratefully, you know, he called a dance of fire, so it's not like he didn't know it, you know? But I will tell you, what helps me a lot in this piece is, have you listened to, I mean, I'm sure you've listened to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, right? So, the difference is that he puts that infliction on the second beat, the dotted, da, 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 di, da, da, right? So he creates a different kind of a dance here. But mm. this movement is a dance. And so just to remind you, I would play, once the music really starts, I would play this a little bit more straightforward, mm -hmm. time-wise, because yeah. that actually makes it easier to, to play it. And the listener who has no idea of the piece will easily understand that this is an actual something that flows. Then, where I would make more difference would be in the different 
types of music. For example, ding tara ding tara. This is definitely more rhythmic, right? But this right. This is where I talk about that beautiful impressionistic influence where there's beautiful melodies. Play them in time, but do you notice he puts these giant legati over them? I would go for that, you know, lyrical. You have beautiful lyrical playing. Use more of it here. But but play it in time to where the listener keeps feeling down one thirty one thirty one thirty right so it's mm-hmm. almost like in a way that feeling in one and then trying to then play different musics more not like ridiculously strictly but more easily to understand that it's all one tempo mm-hmm. okay that's the main thing I wanted to tell you here and I think that mm-hmm. helped me tremendously when I was playing not only for me but also people who hear the piece go oh I'll just yeah I, I can I can nod my head with you now and for me we you know when I'm playing pieces of music which are more dense I really want to make sure the listener gets the most out of them, especially because they're more, more dense with, with, with content or more complex to understand, right? So mm-hmm. that was one thing that just really helped me out. I feel the whole piece in one rather than one, two, get three, one, two, get three, and then simplifying that, that whole idea of the time and then playing different musics inside mm-hmm. that made my life better. And I think a lot of people seem to understand better what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. So maybe, maybe try it and see how you feel. That, what that helps you do as a player, it keeps you in the same condition. You feel that time be the same mm-hmm. and it, it gives you some sort of gravity and a little bit more of sort of stability to then play the piece, mm-hmm. which I, I think then lets you play the piece as well as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. You know? Thank you for clicking. Cool. Just so so I wanted to, you, yes, uh, go ahead. Just I wanted to ask about the tempo at the beginning of the first movement. Yes. Quarter note. 96 mm-hmm. it's too fast for me what do you think about it let me see here's 96 Ding. Dun, dee, dun. Dee. so uh what do i think about it is that mm. first place i would check would be mr Klatso or anyone who's basically you know in the domain of in, in this case, whoever the composer of a piece is when you have a shoe like this. Mm-hmm. I play this piece a little slower, but not much slower. And this is why. The fact that the sound is dark and that the mood is heavy makes you feel a little bit like the tempo is slower. But that does, necess- does not necessarily mean that the tempo should be slower to mm-hmm. get these to happen. So see, the tempo is only a certain kind of organization of this piece. So you can play, here's the tempo, I'll give it to you one more time and I'll, 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 I'll try to sing this. So. Right? Now, is this a little too fast for my taste too? Yes. And that's when, when you have a relationship with peace for a while, if you decide you want to slow it down a little bit, if you can check in with the creator, do, and if not, if you're certain, try it. Okay. But, also, don't be fooled that because the activity of this tempo is a little fast that you cannot play dark and heavy. They're totally separate things. And mm. I guess my question is, how much can you play dark and heavy and stay as close as possible to 96? I do play it slower as well. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And, and listen, you know, that's where, that's where um, I feel like the beauty of this is you hear different interpretations. I feel it like you do. I feel it a little bit you know, more on the, on a, on a heavy side. And I go about 90, maybe even 88, something like that. Mm. Okay. But you know, something to think about for, for you guys, for all, you know, for, for, for all of us, when a composer writes a piece of music at the time, they may have thought say 96 is how I hear this, but later they, they, they hear the piece say at 75 and go, okay, I much prefer that. Yeah. But the score is published. Mm. So they, they're kind of doomed. So a lot of the times it's up to us also to just, be aware and keep helping mature the repertoire. And, you know, if you look at violin and piano repertoire, which is some of the most mature repertoire, as well as orchestral repertoire, how many works do you know when the tempi that are written in are not always played that way? Many instances. I feel like there's that, you know, collective growth and knowledge that we all experience. And so I think it's okay sometimes to very much, you know, be open to these things as long as we're serving the music and we're really well aware of the music and not just sort of making a decision which is early to make. That's what I'm saying. Cool. Thank you so much. Totally. Of course. Thank you too. Mm-hmm.
Yay! And here's Tim. Tim just appears Great. out of thin air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, without taking advantage too much, I don't know if you've got a couple of minutes just for yes, a couple of, course of questions I do. Of for course the guys. I'm, I'm sure people have got a few questions to ask, if that's all right. Coffee. Ah, nice. All right, far away, guys. I can start then. Um, I uh, enjoy your recordings very much, and uh, I'm having a difficult time now, or I've had a difficult time recording now during Corona. I feel like every time I play, I uh, focus a lot on hitting the right notes because, of course, you want to do that, and then you do a lot of takes, and every next take is seems worse. And then <laughs> when I finally get a take that I'm happy with, then I listen back to it and I find out that all the music is gone, kind of. And I'm wondering what what do you do so that you can make the your recordings as you know as as musical and, and yeah just so exciting as you do. First of all, thank you for your kind words. Uh, it, making recordings is not easy, and especially you find that not many people know how to make percussion recordings very well. It's just not as as mature again as a domain compared to say again having a pianist play. You know, this they've been doing it for a long time. A um, couple things. First of all, you really need, when you're in the early stage of making recordings and you're kind of learning both how that's done and also how to do it from your perspective when you're playing, I would just get a set of ears which is not you. Someone who is the producer, someone who you can trust. If they're sure you, hey, listen, don't, don't be inside your head so much. Don't be so self-conscious. You're sounding great. It's time to move on. This sounds perfect. You don't need to worry about it. Because as artists we have very hard time removing ourselves emotionally from what we do. I mean, how could you do it? I mean, it's like, it's your heart and soul you just got put into this and someone tells you to relax? Uh, no, thanks. So finding a person who you love working with, who can produce and can be your ears and your sort of um, very honest sort of reflecting voice, who you can trust and who can help guide you and both tell you when you should, stay and pr play one more time because you have a better take in you and sometimes tell you that you already sound far better than you think and you're just maybe a little tired and you either need to take a break or you need to move on. It's really important. And the more experience you become in this, the more you learn how to do that yourself. And uh, one more thing to tell you, find the best engineer you can. Okay. People save money on recording, but truly that's where the magic is. Not in editing, it's in recording. Okay. How you capture things. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. thanks. Totally. All right. Well, we, we won't hold you up too much. So thank you so much for your words of wisdom tonight. Um, I'm sure everyone agrees. It's been an amazing experience to have you here on the WPG platform. So thanks to Svet for joining us today. Thank you as well to all of you. Congratulations thank to the players and to you, Tim, for all you've done. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we'll just, uh, if everyone just stays where they are for a second, I'll just wrap this one up. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as I said, about 15 minutes ago, uh, concert this evening in about an hour and a half. Really hope that you can join us um, on YouTube. It's going to be HD on YouTube and then I will feed it through from Facebook. But your best bet is YouTube. So please uh, do check in. There's some amazing footage tonight. There really is. So um, look forward to seeing you then. And we'll see you tomorrow for another edition uh, with Pius Chung. Bye for now.